This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 310 of the program. Today is Friday, October 15th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of the folks who make this show possible. All of our newest Patreon, PayPal, YouTube, and Twitch supporters who either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes Cutthroat789, Dirty Pirate90, Kang Lang333. KL, Michelle McConnell, Sandra Teehee, Skeptizi, Sly Annie, Tina Horn, and Yankee211. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you would also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. This week, we've got a great show for you. Kirsten Cinema is teaching a class about corruption at Arizona State University. So of course, we will talk about that. Also in this episode, Jon Stewart shares his thoughts on Trump 2024 and cancel culture, and he's spot on, so I'm really excited to talk about this. Bernie Sanders shows support for India Walton. Charlie Kirk gets humiliated during an abortion debate. Tucker Carlson lies about Fox News' vaccine mandate policy. Marjorie Greene has beef with Trump's attorney, Lynn Wood. And finally, we'll close the show by talking to 2022 congressional candidate Rebecca Parson. That's what we've got on the agenda for today's show. Hopefully, you will enjoy what I have in store for you. We have some additional segments as well. But uh, without further ado, let's get right into it. Last week, we talked about how activists confronted Kirsten Cinema in the bathroom, demanding that she support immigration reform and the Build Back Better Act. And at that time, I made a comment that I think I'm now going to have to walk back. I said, why is she even teaching at ASU? What unique insight could she possibly provide to students? She's just a mindless corporate jo- drone. So what does she know about anything? And I'm going to have to walk back that comment because there is a class that she's teaching that really is perfect for her. So this headline from The Intercept says it all. Senator Kirsten Cinema is literally teaching a course on fundraising. The senator is educating Arizona State University students on her forte asking for money. Yeah, so I think that if you do want to learn how to be corrupt, how to beg for money from your corporate donors, this is something that she knows quite a bit about. The fact that this is a course that's offered, it's not super surprising because colleges offer all kinds of courses. Some of them are really insightful. Others are kind of pointless. It just really depends. This one, however, is definitely something that future politicians might want to know about if they want to play the game in D.C. and win, if they want to become a politician or a lobbyist. It's it's really disgusting and gross, but really this is exactly what you'd expect from Kirsten Cinema. She's not going to be teaching political science 101. She's not going to be teaching history, of course. She's going to literally be teaching students how to be corrupt. And nobody knows better than her. So Ken Klippenstein of The Intercept explains, all students hope to learn from the top experts in their field. Graduate students at Arizona State University have an unusual opportunity this fall to do just that, where Senator Kirsten Sinema is teaching a course on getting rich people to give you money. The course titled Developing Grants and Fundraising is one of two classes Sinema is teaching this fall at Arizona State University's School of Social Work. The syllabus, which was obtained by The Intercept, says students will learn diverse fundraising strategies for nonprofits as well as how to cultivate donors, including large individual donors, by leveraging resources like opportunistic fundraising, finding supporters for major fundraising events, and, well, asking for money. The outline identifies key course concepts such as corporate giving, political strategy, influence, and power, as well as more socially conscious terms like discrimination, oppression, and privilege. One of the required books is Fundraising for Social Change, ironic in light of cinema's attempts to ensure things like corporate tax rates remain unchanged. A spokesperson for Kirsten Cinema did not respond to a request for comment. Fundraising is a subject the Arizona senator knows a thing or two about, having raised eye-popping sums of money from groups opposed 
opposed to President Joe Biden's Build Back Better agenda, Cinema has racked up some $920,000 in campaign contributions from said groups, according to an analysis by Accountable.us, a watchdog group that monitors corporate lobbying. Now, if you want to read the full syllabus, it's 10 pages long. I'll link to it in the description down below. If you are watching this on YouTube, but if you are listening on uh, Spotify or Means TV, you can find this on the Intercepts website. They link to it in the article. But this really, I think it speaks to how broken our system is, where things like this are normalized. In a democratic society, things like this shouldn't have to be taught. It shouldn't be the case that this is so ingrained. It's just what we expect from politics, that classes are literally taught on it. It really speaks to how far we've fallen. And it doesn't just date back to Citizens United. Money in politics has been an issue for a while in American politics. It dates back to Buckley v. Vallejo. But when you live in a capitalist society, eventually, capitalism, like a virus, seeps into every single facet of society, and it inevitably targets democracy itself. And that's really what we're seeing. We're seeing the commodification of democracy, the commodification of elections, to where you can't really be electorally successful unless you raise large sums of money. It's a business. It is a business that companies profit off of now. That really is disgusting. Now, you have a few exceptions. You have Democrats like uh, The Squad, Ilhan Omar, Cory Bush, AOC, who they don't actually raise money from large multinational corporations or elites. They take lots of small dollar donations, and that really is the better model because even if these politicians who raise money from small donors aren't going to be perfect, are they going to be more in touch with what their constituents want? Yeah, because it's human nature. Corruption really is something that it's not that complex. If, let's say, Amazon donates to your campaign or a super PAC and they give you $500,000, it is human nature that you are going to be more kind to them. I mean, just think on an individual level. Put politics aside. If one of your friends walks up to you and they give you $1,000, you're obviously going to be thankful. But if that person says something that you disagree with, if they say that they don't they don't support Medicare for all or they call you stupid and, you know, they think that you're ugly, well, you're going to have a harder time criticizing them because they just gave you $1,000. You're going to maybe bite your tongue or maybe you push back, but not as harsh as you would have had you not been thankful for the large sum of money that they gave you. So it's, it's psychological. It's a human thing to be corrupted by money. And so when you take that and you extrapolate it and you put it on a massive scale like U.S. politics, you see the aggregate effect that it has on our society, where politicians, they don't represent their constituents any longer. They represent their corporate donors. And Kirsten Cinema is teaching a class on just this as if it's normal. The class isn't necessarily about the way that money in politics has corrupted our democratic institutions. It's how to participate in what is tantamount to legalized bribery. That's so gross, but this, this is what we've come to expect from one of the most corrupt senators in the united states and i can't even say that she you know it's i think that it's a misrepresentation to say that she's one of the most corrupt she's just more brazen about it than other senators but many senators are corrupt most senators are corrupt sadly just last week we were talking about how john hickenlooper was questioning facebook about their profits if they changed their algorithm to not actually promote hatred now, come to find out, he has lots of money in stocks in, in Facebook. So this is something that is ingrained in society. It's not just corruption from donors. There's conflicts of interest. Senators own stocks. They profit off of the companies that they're supposed to be regulating. And none of this is even controversial. It happens out in the open. And we just kind of, as a society, we come to expect it now. And over time, that erodes the fabric of democracy. It's antithetical to a representative democracy. And Kirsten Sinema is trying to, rather than break up that, rather than speak out against it and the ways that it has helped to deteriorate democracy in the United States, she's teaching about it as, a, as if it's normal. Well, you know, this is just the system. This is what the system incentivizes, so I'm just teaching that. But really, it, what... What a stupid class to teach. What a dumb class to take. You should be teaching about the impact that money in politics has 
on democracy rather than trying to propagate that. But uh, again, like I'm not going to try to police the things that are taught at colleges because they teach everything, but this is just sad. The one thing that she possibly has any knowledge about, that's what she's teaching about at ASU. It's not, it's not surprising. It's just, it's like a parody. It's like a parody that has come to life and it just is so depressing and embarrassing and expected. I just found out that Jon Stewart actually has a new show on Apple TV, and I haven't checked it out yet, but he did an interview, I believe, about his new show, and he said a couple of things about subjects that is on everyone's mind that we're all thinking about, and what he had to say, the insight that he offers is really uh, refreshing to hear. So the first thing that he talks about is Trump 2024 and the prospects of him getting reelected, and he basically says what we're all thinking. He has a really, really good shot at getting reelected, unfortunately. This is the reality of the situation, and it's a little bit early to try to figure out what is actually going to take place in 2024. But assuming Trump is going to run again, does he have a good chance? Absolutely. So as Judy Kurtz of The Hill explains, Jon Stewart says former President Trump has a very good chance of winning back the White House if he enters the 2024 race. I think he's got it. He's got a very good chance, and they're smarter about it, Stewart said Sunday during an interview with David Remnick at the 22nd Annual New Yorker Festival. He's brilliant at understanding what will drive the television narratives, Stewart said, referring to Trump. Stewart also predicted that if Trump runs again, it will all be about January 6th and stop the steal. But what I think they really learned from this experience was there are really specific pivot points within the American electoral system, and those pivot points are generally the administration of elections run by partisans, but not by ideologues, he said. The actual danger of what happened at the Capitol in January, Stewart added, is that it exposed a fragility at a level that is not flashy or sexy or known. While Trump has repeatedly teased a potential 2024 White House bid, he hasn't formally declared his candidacy. I thought he disqualified himself at every turn in 2016, the former Daily Show host said of Trump, adding that the former president displayed an antibiotic resistant strain of populism. He came at the right moment for that audience with the right message and unapologetic, and in a lot of ways, I think every time you thought that something was disqualifying or something would defeat him, but for those of us who have been in New York, we probably saw, like if nothing else, the dude's resilient, Stewart 58 said. And unfortunately, I think that Jon Stewart is correct here. One thing that I disagree with him on is that Donald Trump is brilliant when it comes to television narratives. I do believe that Trump is good at creating narratives, but I don't think that Trump is deliberately trying to disseminate certain narratives. I think that he says something and the media will cover it because Trump is good at generating ratings. So, I mean, Trump may be savvy somewhat as a media personality in some ways, but I don't want to give Trump too much credit. I think that a lot of things happen on accident. There were some theories that really irritated me about Donald Trump that, oh, he, he's doing this to distract you from this, or he's doing this to distract you from that, and he's trying to play 3D and 4D chess. I think that he's dumb, and a lot of the things that he does, the consequences of his actions usually are the result of coincidences or accidents. But either way, I think that he's correct overall about the larger point that if Trump were to run in 2024, he really would have a great chance. And yes, this is going to be about January 6th and stop the steal, which means that Trump in 2024 would be a lot more dangerous because now he is running to further delegitimize a system that's already barely holding up. He's going to run on, listen, I was denied, I was cheated, so that's not only going to give him the advantage in the Republican 2024 primary, because nobody else is going to want to challenge the president who the base loves, who was cheated, so that's going to help him there, and furthermore, he's going to hammer home in a 2024 election against Joe Biden or Kamala Harris, I was cheated, I was cheated, I was cheated, and eventually people are going to think, well, since he was cheated... Well, of course, we should reward him with the presidency that he was illegitimately denied. And overall, the discourse will continue to deteriorate and the situation will get worse. Republicans will grow increasingly authoritarian and do what they can to actually cheat him to victory. Now, they're, they're already kind of doing that by gerrymandering. 
They're already doing that by instituting voter suppression laws, particularly in areas where Trump did not do as well as he did before. So, for example, in Texas, one thing that really drove voter turnout was drive through voting, and they got rid of that, or they're trying to. I believe that they did already do that. But mail-in voting, one thing that hurt Donald Trump because it increased turnout, they're doing away with that in many states. So, we have a lot of things when you put them all together, they they tend to add up and they hurt democracy. I just covered a story where there were 11 states that had passed laws that allowed their state legislatures to subvert elections in the event they don't turn out the way that they like. Now, that doesn't mean that they can just say, well, we don't like the results. We're going to overturn them like that. But what it does mean is that they have more power as opposed to local governments who usually control these uh, these elections. So it's just overall, it's it's really scary to think about. That being said, I think it is still a little bit too early to speculate about 2024, but Jon Stewart said everything that's on our minds. Yeah, he's probably going to run again, and if he does, he has a phenomenal chance. Now, he also commented on cancel culture, and coming from a comedian, what he's going to say is actually very refreshing yet again because he says something that you wouldn't expect a comedian to say because all comedians are seemingly in lockstep on this particular issue but he takes it in a different direction it says something that's pretty common sense in my opinion but seemingly most people don't agree with this point of view so here's what he says stewart also knocked the absurdity of cancel culture in his virtual chat with remnick people that talk about cancel culture never seem to shut the fuck up about it the comedian said like there's more speech now than ever before he said the internet has democratized criticism what do we do for a living we talk shit we criticize we postulate we opine we make jokes and now other people are having their say And that's not cancel culture, that's relentlessness. We live in a relentless culture, Stewart said, and the system of internet and all those other things are incentivized to find the pressure points of that and exacerbate it. And to that I say, exactly. He is exactly right here. The people who complain about cancel culture are usually people who are very powerful who haven't actually been canceled. Maybe they've seen some accountability for their actions. Maybe they've been criticized. But the amount of people who claim they've been canceled, well, it seems like they're still around. How many people themselves can claim, well, I've been canceled for this or that? Well, if you've been canceled for something, that implies that you're 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 gone. You're you're canceled. But that's not actually happening. So what he says here is that, yeah, freedom of speech has been democratized because of social media. Before, we never had the opportunity to interact directly with a celebrity, but now, if a celebrity says something that's stupid, like Nicki Minaj, if she tweets about her friend's cousin's swollen testicles, we can directly challenge her and say, you are stupid, and there is a chance that she might see that. I mean, there's a lot of people tweeting at her at once, so odds are still diminished that we're going to get through to her directly, but have the chances increased? Yes. And if enough people say something all at once, odds are that celebrity is going to hear it. This is unique. This has never happened before. And it's all possible because of the internet and social media. So because of that, we're trying to figure out as a society how to deal with this new phenomenon. And a lot of celebrities who usually are insulated in their bubbles and surround themselves with yes men, they've never had to deal with this before. So what do they do? They melt down like snowflakes and they claim I'm being canceled when in actuality you're not being canceled. You're still rich. You still have a mansion. You still are at the tippy top of the social hierarchy in the United States. You still have power. You're just being a baby about the fact that for once you're facing criticism and sometimes that criticism is going to be illegitimate. Sometimes that criticism is going to be too harsh. But it doesn't mean that cancel culture is this rampant phenomenon, and certainly the hysteria over cancel culture is definitely overblown at a minimum, and that's what I think that John Stewart is getting at, and it's nice to see him say that because this is what I've said as well. And I would like to think that people would already acknowledge this because cancel culture isn't as big of a thing as people want you to believe it is, and certainly discourse surrounding cancel culture has been weaponized by political actors, so the conversation overall is usually bad faith and disingenuous. So I feel like what he's saying shouldn't be that surprising. It should be common sense to most people, but it really isn't. A lot of people view cancel culture as a real threat, and to the extent that cancel culture exists, it's not that prevalent as a phenomenon as many people would like us to believe. So John Stewart here, his insight is really great to see because what he says 
is common sense. Saying something that's that's common sense like this is necessary and it makes a difference. So I'm glad that he spoke on these issues. I absolutely agree with him. And uh, I hope he says more if he's going to offer refreshingly common sense takes like this. Um, I'll have to check out a show because, yeah, it seems like Jon Stewart still kind of has his finger on the pulse for the most part. I'm sure that I have a lot of disagreements with him on certain things, but at least on these things, things that he... Uh, that his insight is usually really valuable, cancel culture, uh, yeah, as a comedian. I, I like that he's saying this. It's, it's common sense, in my opinion. As Fox News hosts continue to criticize vaccine mandates as some sort of a liberal authoritarian plot, I find it really fascinating how they're all remaining conspicuously silent on the policy instituted by their employer, Fox News. Because believe it or not, the vaccine policy at Fox News is even more strict than the one put into place by the Biden administration. And the White House actually praised Fox News, sarcastically of course, for instituting their own version of a vaccine mandate. And the company was even called out by a former Fox News host, Eric Bowling. Quote, Fox was attacked from the right by a former employee, Eric Bowling. Now on the conservative network Newsmax, Bowling said Wednesday night that network leaders are pushing the wrong policies. So while Fox hosts bemoan and complain about the liberals who are forcing Americans to get vaccinated, they themselves are doing the same thing. And that is the textbook definition of hypocrisy, he said. And Eric Bowling may be wrong about virtually every other issue, but when it comes to the hypocrisy of Fox News' hosts, he's absolutely correct here. This is hypocritical. So why won't Fox hosts condemn their company's policy or even at a minimum address it? Well, finally, one of them decided to speak up. Tucker Carlson, of course. And uh, what he says here is interesting because he doesn't actually condemn Fox News' policy. Rather, he chooses to deny that they have a vaccine mandate altogether. This I always get a kick out of. Fox News. <laughs> Fox News requires vaccinations for all employees. Give me a break. Fox News. Now, to be clear, we just have a show on this channel. That's it. We don't run the company and we would never presume to speak for the company. But as a factual matter, what Joe Biden just said is completely untrue. It is a lie, period. We can say that with authority since we work here. Every day, literally alone among big media outlets, Fox News defends this country's most basic civil liberties, what we used to refer to as the Bill of Rights. To cynical authoritarians like Joe Biden and the ghouls around him like Susan Rice, that just can't be genuine. They assume the people you see on Fox News must be pretending. Pretending for money or prestige or ratings or something else. But they are wrong. We are not pretending at all. It's real. Oh, is that so? Well then, I'm sure you'd have no problem disclosing your vaccination status, right, Tucker? Yeah, didn't think so. He's not going to do that because then he looks like a gigantic fraud because we all know, I know it, you know it, he knows it, that he is vaccinated. I'm sure he was vaccinated as soon as he became eligible. He's vaccinated, but if he tells the truth about his vaccination status, then after fear-mongering about the COVID-19 vaccines, he looks like a fraud to his audience. And furthermore, it's really hard to believe that Fox News doesn't have this sort of a policy when there's evidence that they have this policy. And Fox News themselves, they put out this video uh, where they've celebrated their 25-year anniversary. And would you look at that? Every single person is wearing masks. Every single person. So Tucker knows what he's doing, but I mean, he's a propagandist. So what he could do is just uh, pretend like he is as principled as he is in actuality. And he could just say, look, I'm not vaccinated. We know that that's, uh, you know, that's not true. But, you know, he might not want to do that because perhaps he has an issue with lying. I mean, I lie if I'm really cornered or something. I lie. Oh, OK. Well, then never mind. But look, maybe it's the case that Tucker Carlson hasn't actually gotten vaccinated. We don't know because he hasn't disclosed the status yet, but in the event he hasn't gotten the vaccine and he actually is walking the walk, well then, uh, here's what his life is like working at Fox News. As Justin Bargona of The Daily Beast explains, while Fox has boasted that over 90% of its staffers are vaccinated, it is not requiring all of its employees to get the shot. Instead, the company is requiring daily testing for those who refuse to get the jab or haven't revealed their vaccination status. 
So technically, you could still work at Fox News and not be vaccinated, but if that's the case, then you will be subjected to daily COVID-19 tests. And let me remind you that that's more strict than the policy put into place by the Biden administration. So OSHA is going to mandate that uh, companies with more than 100 employees, if they don't require vaccines, then they subject those employees to weekly vac- uh, COVID-19 testing. But Fox News is saying, mm, if you're not going to get the vaccination or you're not going to tell us what your vaccination status is, you're going to get tested every single day to continue working here. But yet, Tucker Carlson hasn't spoken out against that. And, you know, you can make the case that technically this isn't a real mandate since there is a test out option. But Tucker Carlson says that the Biden administration's policy is effectively a vaccine mandate and that it's bad. So if that is a vaccine mandate and it's draconian, then by his own standards, the Fox News vaccine mandate or vaccine policy, whatever he wants to call it, is worse. It's orders of magnitude worse. So based on his own standards, based on his principles, he should be more outraged at the vaccine policy of his employer than the one instituted by the White House. But yet, he won't condemn Fox News. And now, when he finally addresses it, he just denies. He's lying. We know he's lying. So the question is, if he's really a principled truth teller, Why won't he call out his employer? If you're as against vaccine mandates as you say you are, wouldn't it be logical to condemn your employer? It just, it doesn't make sense why he won't do this. It's almost like he's full of shit. And usually I don't go out of my way to share MSNBC clips because I have my issues with that network as well. But there's a clip from uh, Chris Hayes, which is really worth sharing because he kind of calls Tucker Carlson's bluff. He says, listen, if you truly believe that the vaccines are bad and vaccine mandates are bad, then of course you have no choice. You have to call out your employer. Otherwise, you look like a fraud. Take a look. I think Tucker Carlson is going to quit Fox News. Now, hear me out, okay? Fox News, as I have told you, is running one of the most destructive disinformation campaigns I've ever seen. It's exacerbating one of the deadliest periods in American history. Media Matters found the channel pushed claims undermining vaccines 99% of the days in the past six months. And the hosts over there are strenuously opposed to vaccine mandates or requirements, right? They let you know every chance they get. Joe, you canceled all medical freedom today with your broad edict and your mandates. When you start diving into private business, that's where the rubber hits the road. This is tyranny and it's getting more and more aggressive. This is autocracy. It is the beginning of the communist style social credit system. These demands are so obviously irrational that forcing you to accept them without complaint is the whole point of the exercise. It is a form of sadomasochism. It is dominance and submission. It's about power. If they can make you take medicine you don't want or need, they've won. You are theirs. You belong to them. Sadomasochism, spicy Tucker, would willingly suffer in such submission. It's why Fox News has been celebrating the very brave resistors in other organizations who have resigned from their jobs or gotten fired or placed on some kind of leave rather than get the vaccine or be owned. They brought on nurses and teachers, even an army lieutenant colonel. But their newest champion is someone at another cable channel, ESPN, a host there named Sage Steele, who is now suspended from being on air, partly for appearing on a podcast and going after her employer for mandating vaccines. I think to mandate, I respect everyone's decision. I really do. But to mandate it is um, sick Mm -hmm. and it's scary to me in many ways. Um, But I have a job. Yeah. A job that I love and frankly, a job that I, that I need. But again, I love it. I just, um, I'm not surprised it got to this point, especially mm-hmm. with Disney. I mean, a, a global company. Okay, so as you just saw there, ESPN's Sage Steele had the courage of her convictions. She got vaccinated because they required her, but then she went and she called out her employer's vaccine mandate, even though it got her suspended, which naturally made her a hero at Fox News. I think Sage is brave for being willing to say exactly what she thinks. I agree with everything Sage said. I don't think it makes sense for uh, for ESPN to be mandating the vaccine for employees. I think they should be allowing employees to make their choices. 
The irony here, again, is that none of these people, Clay Travis, Brian Kilmeade to Tucker Carlson, have shown that same bravery to call out their own network and their own employer. The Fox News vaccine requirement is stricter than the one proposed by President Joe Biden and described as tyranny and creeping communism. Fox is requiring unvaccinated employees to be tested every day. And inside the buildings, I mean, just look at this video of the opening of their new DC bureau. Everyone is wearing masks and are most likely also vaccinated or getting tested every day because that is what their company is mandating. Now, Tucker Carlson has been the most vocal anti-vaccination voice in American media. And unless he just does not actually believe any of the stuff he's saying, and it's all just a craven, cynical act for ratings while he himself is vaxxed and people die needlessly by the thousands, he might just be highlighting all those other people who showed actual courage as he works up his own courage, you know, kind of through osmosis to walk out. Because if you truly believe you are suffering under the sadomasochistic heel of a tyrannical employer, even if they are paying you lots and lots of money, even if you don't want people to think you're a total fraud, then you have got to have the guts to call out Fox News or resign in protest. There's no other option. It's the only way forward. You can do it, Tucker. I believe in you. Yeah, but he's not going to do that. If he really felt as strongly about vaccine mandates as he says he does, he would quit. He would resign in protest. But he's not doing that because Tucker Carlson is a disingenuous, bad faith actor and he knows his role. He's a propagandist. The words that come out of his mouth, I don't know how much of it he believes, but either way, this should prove to everyone that he's a bullshitter. But Fox's audience doesn't know about the vaccine policy at Fox News. Fox's audience doesn't know or even probably think about the prospect of Tucker Carlson himself being vaccinated. So while Tucker Carlson tells them how bad vaccine mandates are and how bad the vaccine is, they're going to listen. Meanwhile, he's protected. At his place of employment, everyone's wearing masks. Everyone's vaccinated or testing daily. He's vaccinated most likely. And so, you know, he, he'll say one thing, but his actions don't line up with his words. And that is, by definition, fraudulent. So uh, it's this is really interesting. I don't think this was a good idea for him to address this because it just it makes him look like a bigger fraud than he already did. But still, I mean, um, I think that this will appease his audience. So in the end, it's not going to hurt him or his ratings. But either way, if you still think that Tucker Carlson is some sort of a brave truth teller, you have been duped. Do you truly, in your heart of hearts, truly believe that this is a human being? This? Without a doubt. Without a doubt? Yes. This is a dolphin fetus. So let me- Without a doubt, a dolphin so fetus is a human being. This is a human fetus. Look how similar they look. That amazing clip was from a debate featuring Charlie Kirk and comedian Ben Glebe. And the reason why it's so incredible is because Ben Glebe sets up a trap and Charlie Kirk unknowingly walks right into it, and the result is just humiliating for Charlie Kirk. Now, there's a lot more to be said about that exchange, but before I talk more about this, I do want to share the extended version of that clip so you can see kind of what happens in the lead up to that moment and shortly afterwards. Uh, so, uh, enjoy. At eight weeks, we have tails. Uh, at eight weeks, an em uh, 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 embryo has tails. Do humans have tails, Charlie? I I'm sorry, what? Serious question, do human beings have tails? I'm not exactly sure the essence of the Do question. Do human beings have tails? Do you have a tail? You know, I, I have never met anyone with a tail. I'm not exactly sure the essence. Exactly. The but fetuses have tails. Kind of proves that at that phase, they are not a human being. They got tails. Humans don't have tails. We're not dinosaurs. Let me even show you a photo, if I may, okay? Do you truly, in your heart of hearts, truly believe that this is a human being? This? Without a doubt. Without a doubt? Yes. This is a dolphin fetus. So let me Without a doubt, a dolphin so fetus is a human being. This is a human fetus. Look how similar they look, but quite different. Dolphin. You just confirmed that a dolphin in, in life, do you confuse dolphins for human babies often? So let me you ask go to SeaWorld and you're like, someone's got human babies in that aquarium. Get the human babies out of the aquarium. 
Well, you labeled it as a human fetus. No, so I did, did not. That dishonestly. No, I did not. But I didn't label it as anything. Let me. But you. Let me say let me, human fetus on there. Let me ask you a question though. So let's let's hold up those two pictures again. Sure. Is there a moral difference between the dolphin and the baby? At this stage, no. No, just, no, no, and no, you no, just no. confirmed that. I, I, no, let me ask you. Perfection. That was sheer perfection. Uh, what we just saw was a debate tactic that I want more leftists to use because Ben Glebe is kind of using Charlie Kirk's tactic against him. Because if you watch longer on, and I'll link to the full debate down below for anyone who wants to see it, Charlie Kirk, once he kind of gets knocked off of his feet, he gets back up and he then uses the same tactic that Ben Glebe just used on him. Because what Ben Glebe did was he kind of presented Charlie Kirk with a, a common sense question. Right? This is a fetus, and the argument is that life begins at conception for Charlie Kirk. So, of course, if he is given an image of what he believes is a human fetus, he's going to answer. But in answering and knowing that he's going to answer, you kind of prove Ben's point that mm, does life really begin at conception if you can't tell the difference between a dolphin fetus and a human fetus? Isn't this just a clump of cells at this point? Now, the way that Charlie Kirk rebounds from that is he asks, okay, well, is that human fetus that you showed me, is that dead or alive? Ben Glebe then says, it's dead. Now, that was a bait as well, and Charlie Kirk kind of got him into a corner by saying that, because it's not dead, but the point is that does life begin at conception? That's the point of contention that they're both arguing over. So to say that it's dead and to bait Ben Glebe into saying, yes, it's dead, you kind of prove your point as well. So I don't necessarily know that this was a blowout for Charlie Kirk or for Ben Glebe overall, but that particular moment was really, really insightful. Because, one, it shows how successful leftists can be when they replicate the same debate tactics of right-wingers, and two... It's important because what Ben Glebe did there was masterfully attack the root, the core of Charlie Kirk's argument. Now, Charlie Kirk goes on uh, to explain his thoughts on abortion, but really, if we could find one moment in the debate where he summarizes his entire worldview about how he believes life begins at conception, uh, it's it's this clip that we're going to show you. Uh, now, Basically, if you establish that life begins at conception and you accept that notion, then of course, if that is indeed life, if a fetus is life, then of course, killing it is tantamount to killing a fully developed human being once you kind of accept that premise. So take a look at what Charlie Kirk says, and then I'll tell you why this whole pro-life, this quote-unquote pro-life thing that he's trying to espouse here, doesn't actually add up if we're logically consistent. Take a look. This really kind of goes down to the question of when does human life begin? When does personhood begin? And the science of embryology says very clearly that life, human life, begins at conception. Now, speaking non-scientifically as a moral argument, we have overseen the slaughter of our fellow citizens over the last couple decades. This is a genocide, dare I say a holocaust, of our citizens that has occurred since Roe versus Wade. You talked about women. Well, just statistically, half of the 62 million abortions since Roe versus Wade are 31 million women that never had the chance to live. So first of all, I just want to say that regardless if abortion is legal or not, they're still going to continue to happen. Banning abortions is not going to lead to less abortions. Instead of them being safe and legal now, they'll just be unsafe and illegal. But by banning abortions, you're not going to get rid of abortions entirely. But to get to Charlie Kirk's argument here, he claims that that right there, that fetus, that's human life. And it's so important that we protect that human life that we violate a woman's bodily autonomy, even if she doesn't want that clump of cells in her, well, you know, that's that's life. If you don't think it's life, well, then at least it's going to develop into a human being at some point. So he's taking what he believes is a pro-life stance, but if you take that pro-life position and you extend it, then logically it should also follow that Charlie Kirk believes that under no circumstances should a state have the death penalty. Under no circumstances should war ever be supported. He should be a pacifist. He should also support medical advancements that save lives, such as the COVID-19 vaccines. He should also be very pro-life when it comes to supporting refugees and asylum seekers. He should also make sure that no human being on the planet goes hungry and that everyone has basic health care. And certainly the most pro-life stance of all means that we do everything in our power, dedicate every single 
penny that we have to make sure that there is a planet for future generations and we have to combat climate change. That is the ultimate test of who is and isn't pro-life. If you don't believe that there should be a habitable planet for future generations, then you're not pro-life. That's the logical extension of this pro-life stance. But that's not what Charlie Kirk believes. In fact, he disagrees with all of the things that I just listed. So it's weird that you're pro-life when it comes to fetuses, but that's where you draw the line. I mean, certainly, if you're going to accept this notion, which I do not, but if you're going to accept that life begins at conception, then wouldn't you accept that a fully developed life, a child who's sentient, who can think, who can feel pain, is also deserving of life? So why stop supporting life after the fetus is born? Either Charlie Kirk doesn't actually care about life because he does want to control a woman's body, or he doesn't really care either way. And like many Republican politicians, he's just using this as a wedge issue to slide through a really insidious right-wing economic agenda that disproportionately benefits elites. What is this really about? Because if you say that you're pro-life, why do you arbitrarily draw the line at fetuses, but once the baby is born, we don't care if that baby deals with war and global anthropogenic climate change. We don't care if that baby goes hungry and doesn't have health care. Why draw the line there? The entire pro-life movement, and it's a misrepresentation to even call them pro-life, the entire pro-life movement is based on a farce. Clips like this are so persuasive because Charlie Kirk, he's just a talking head. He has a lot of rehearsed talking points, but Ben Glee, being a comedian, he was able to kind of knock him off balance, kind of prove how silly his point is. So overall, I think that this was really, really incredible to see, and this is something that you can easily replicate uh, on a personal level. If you have a really anti-abortion uncle or someone in your family who's anti-abortion, and please don't call them pro-life, call them anti-abortion because they've shown time and again that they're not pro-life, they're just anti-abortion. But if you have someone in your family that's anti-abortion, you can do the same thing. Show them a picture of, uh, I don't know, an elephant fetus, and will they be able to tell the difference? Probably not. Probably not. So where they choose to arbitrarily believe life begins, like that entire notion that anti-abortionists base their worldview on, it can easily be dismantled just like that. And a comedian did it in less than 30 seconds to a right-wing hack who's been trained to debate people, who knows which rhetoric is effective to use. So if it works on Charlie Kirk, it's going to work on someone you know, and perhaps you can use this same tactic and change somebody's mind. Well, folks, we've got trouble in Trump world and two individuals from Trump world who should, in theory, be totally aligned on everything are actually beefing currently and they're exchanging insults. And I'm talking about Trump attorney Lynn Wood and Marjorie Taylor Greene. What we're about to read is truly bizarre, but it's totally expected in 2021 America. So first, let's look at what Lynn Wood said about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, this is certainly interesting, to say the least. So as Jason Lemon of Newsweek explains, in my opinion, Marjorie Taylor Greene is a communist, Wood said in Friday remarks. If Marjorie Taylor Greene is running around saying impeach Biden, that says that Biden won. He didn't, the attorney said, and you would never impeach him with a communist Congress. It's a waste of time. Wood went on to suggest that Greene may be a traitor. A traitor will come at you as a patriot. Be careful, Wood said. Now, the first thing that I'll say about this is that to see someone who calls everyone else a communist, to see someone who uses the word communist as a synonym for bad be called a communist herself, it really is satisfying to see. Having said that, though, to suggest that Marjorie Green of all people, is a communist is just, it's obviously absurd on its face. And he's criticizing her because she wants to impeach Biden when you'd think that a MAGA chud would want that to happen, but it's bad, according to him, because to want to impeach Biden, you acknowledge that he's president in the first place, which in and of itself is a no-no. 
So you you have to pretend like Trump is actually still the president if you actually want to be part of this cult. It's really, really bizarre. But if you think that Marjorie Green let that slide, you'd be mistaken because she hit back with a very powerful no you and accused him of some things that are pretty uh, big as well. Bigly, uh, I should say. Green responded on Saturday with an attack of her own. She suggested that Wood attempted to take money donated to his former client, Kyle Rittenhouse. The young man has been criminally charged with fatally shooting two people during a Black Lives Matter demonstration in Wisconsin last year while he was still a minor. People donated money through Fight Back Law, Lynn Wood, to Kyle Rittenhouse's legal defense. Kyle fired Lynn in December. People didn't donate to Lynn Wood, so why would he want $2 million back? Green wrote in a post published to her Telegram channel. Only monsters hurt innocent people in their greatest time of need. She's talking about Kyle Rittenhouse, by the way. Jesus. She continued, The GOP congresswoman urged followers to donate to a different fundraising campaign for Rittenhouse. Green then raised questions about the motives behind Wood's actions in the wake of the 2020 election. If Lynn Wood has fought so hard against the election like he claims, even encouraging people to go in the Capitol on January 6th, why isn't he the target of the January 6th witch hunt, she asked. Got him. The J6 House Select Committee is only focused on Trump's biggest defenders, but not Lynn Wood, Green wrote. Hmm. Wood later posted more criticism of Green on his Telegram channel. I love Marjorie Taylor Green, but I have raised serious concerns about her failure to take meaningful action to fix 2020, he wrote. I believed in Marjorie. Now that I have questioned her failure to act to fix 2020, it appears that Marjorie no longer believes in me. To the contrary, she has attacked me with lies and misrepresentations, the attorney continued. A monster? Are you kidding me? He asked. Wood then suggested that Green was becoming part of the so-called deep state. <laughs> I'm also still willing to help her to prevent her from falling even into an even deeper deep state ditch, he wrote. So my favorite part about this is that they're just going back and forth, accusing someone, uh, accusing the other of something that's just batshit fucking insane. Actually, I think you're a communist. Well, you're part of the deep state. Ha ha. I mean, this is real stupid, folks. This is incredibly fucking stupid. They remind me of, like, two birds fighting over a corn kernel in a piece of dog shit. They both look ridiculous. They sound crazy. And anyone who's watching this should be perplexed, but also entertained, because this is truly funny. And, I mean, regardless of what they're fighting about, I don't know what catalyzed this. I don't know why Lynn Wood chose to take a shot at Marjorie Green because seemingly he's the one who drew first blood. But I like this. Anytime there's trouble in Trump world, that's good for America. Objectively so. If you care about America and democracy, we need all of these little goons to be fighting each other because so long as they're fighting each other, then uh, they're at least preoccupied. They're not ruining the country or ruining it as quickly, I should say. But Marjorie Green here, uh, if I have to take a side, I've got a side with uh, Marjorie Green, I guess, because she doesn't seem like the one who provoked this exchange, right? And not that I would ever side with Marjorie Green on anything, but it could be the case that perhaps she implied that he was taking money or embezzling money from the Kyle Rittenhouse legal fund and maybe she just hinted at it and he didn't like that. I'm not necessarily sure how this began. It's really gross for her to suggest that Kyle Rittenhouse was some innocent person. This is a kid that showed up to a Black Lives Matter protest and he killed two people. So I just, I don't know what to say about this. To, to read this is truly surreal. I mean, look, it's expected in 2021 America, but still, even if this is the type of discourse that I'd expect from American politics nowadays, it's still really surreal and feels like a parody to read this. It feels like something you'd see from some political satire. But here you have these two dipshits, one calling someone a communist who's clearly not a communist and then accusing her of being part of the deep state. And then she's saying, oh, well, actually, hmm, it's a little bit sus that out of all of the people around Donald Trump, he's conspicuously not being investigated when he encouraged people to go to the House. And she kind of has a point. Maybe he should be investigated. I don't know. Either way, um, this put a smile on my face, and I hope that it uh, did the same for you, because watching these two idiots fight each other back and forth, it's basically a real-life version of the Spider-Man pointing at Spider-Man meme, but I hate them both. They're both wrong. They're both stupid, but I love this, and I hope that they keep this up. 
So we've been following the mayoral race that's taking place in Buffalo, New York for quite some time on this program, and there really shouldn't be anything to talk about at this point. There shouldn't, but there is. So in this city, in Buffalo, it's heavily slanted towards the Democratic Party. So if you win the Democratic Party primary, you are essentially going to win the general election. It's usually a foregone conclusion, but that's not necessarily the case here because India Walton defeated the incumbent Democratic Party mayor, Byron Brown, and he has refused to concede. Okay, now you think, what's the big deal? He's not conceding. So what? She's still going to win, except he's chosen to not concede and run a sore loser right in campaign. And when you are the four-term incumbent mayor with a lot of name recognition and more importantly big money donors on your side i think that that write-in campaign is something that actually could be competitive which is frustrating but nonetheless here we are and i want to share a quick clip from an interview that india walton did with jen perlman and peter hager and she explains the situation uh, and it's just it's truly truly frustrating so i won the democratic primary 65% of registered voters in Buffalo are Democrats, right? So you win the Democratic primary, traditionally it's assumed you're the presumptive mayor. Um, well, the 16 year four term incumbent uh, didn't concede. Um, he started a writing campaign and not only is he doing a writing campaign, but a couple of weeks ago, he got a local judge to rule that our state Board of Elections deadline to file independent nominating petitions was unconstitutional and put him back on the ballot. Um, so we had to appeal that decision. We went to court. We got him off the ballot. But now, like all of this Republican money is being flooded into the race. There's independent expenditures. There are commercials that are like blatantly lying, saying I'm going to lay off 100 police officers who are all going to be people of color and women. Um, a video surfaced last night of him saying that I'm going to um, allow rapists, free sex predators. Um, it's, it's just ridiculous. But, uh, you know, he has so much power and privilege and money that they're able to play these things on a constant loop. And, you know, the more people hear this stuff, the more likely they are to actually believe that it's true. So it's um, it's funny in a way. And then in a way, it's kind of not because we won fair and square and um, really want to bring positive change for working class people in Buffalo. And we're up against this monumental, um, pretty nasty fight. Yeah, so if this write-in campaign works, it really speaks to how powerful big money is in the United States. Now, I hope that it doesn't work. I hope that he fails, obviously, because India Walton is the real deal. She actually wants to tackle poverty. She actually ran a competitive primary, and Byron Brown did nothing. He sat on his ass, and he expected himself to just win by default. He didn't run a campaign. So she won. Her constituents clearly chose her over him, and yet he's refusing to step down. So she needs help. It's not like she's automatically going to win because she defeated him in the Democratic Party primary. This is basically uh, part two of the Democratic Party primary, except now whoever wins actually does get sworn in as the mayor. So she needs a lot of help. And there's been leftists who are speaking out, but now the most important leftist in the country has chosen to uh, stake his claim here. Bernie Sanders, and he is going to war for India Walton. So he actually sent out a fundraising email on her behalf, encouraging all of his supporters to donate to her campaign. And it reads, when Democratic Socialist India Walton launched her campaign for mayor of Buffalo, they said she was too radical to win. She said she was bold and visionary. They said she had no chance to beat a four-term incumbent. Then, earlier this year, she shocked everyone and won a close primary race that was only possible because she showed the political power of an agenda that puts people first much like we did when I first was elected mayor of Burlington 40 years ago. Now the establishment incumbent she defeated in the primary is running a write-in campaign in the general election, which is less than a month away. He is being funded by wealthy corporate developers and fighting for an agenda that benefits them. Quote, when we think about socialism, you know, we're perfectly fine with socialism for the rich. We bail out Wall Street banks and give a billion dollars in tax incentives to one of the richest people in the world. And when it comes to providing resources working families need to thrive, socialism becomes scary. 
That may remind you a lot of our campaign, but it was India Walton's response to attacks calling her a democratic socialist. She ran a bold campaign, she talked about the issues people care about, and she won. Now, India Walton's opponent may have the support of people like Carl Palladino, a Trump-supporting Republican real estate developer. But India Walton has something her opponent does not, and that is the people. Now, there's another part from Bernie's fundraising email that I'm going to read to you, but I just want to pause right there and, and talk about how important this is because Bernie Sanders is a fundraising machine. He doesn't have this huge contact list of elites, millionaires, billionaires, donors that he can call, but he does have this huge email list that the DNC was thirsting for, which he never gave to them, I'm assuming, and that in and of itself can do wonders. By sending out this one email, he probably helped her raise tens of thousands of dollars, and that really makes a difference in a city where every penny is going to count. So if you also want to support India Walton, I will link you to her campaign website down below. You can donate a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, twenty-seven dollars, whatever you donate helps. Because if she can actually win and be a successful blueprint for what can be done to improve people's lives, then obviously that benefits the cause of leftists overall. Now, there's another thing that I want to point out that Bernie Sanders uh, talked about in this email, and it was too perfect to not share. He writes, when progressives lose elections, we are all supposed to get in line and rally around the establishment candidate and do everything we can to help them win. And we do. When progressives win, they get primaries like AOC, Rashida, and Ilhan all did last cycle. But much like those three, India is going to rally the support of working people and she's going to win as well. And so I love that he made this point because I've made the same point as well. It's so frustrating. It's infuriating. Democrats will always say after the primary is over, okay, it's time to vote blue no matter who. It's time to get in line behind the person who won. But you can see now firsthand that when it happens to somebody that they don't like, they're not willing to preach unity. In fact, Byron Brown is doing everything he possibly can to divide people. And it's truly, it's it's interesting that nobody in the establishment has called him out. Is Nancy Pelosi or Jim Clyburn going to come out and denounce Byron Brown? No, of course not. Because it's unity for thee and not me. That's the mantra of the Democratic Party. And even like putting aside this, uh, this race... Back in 2020, when it looked likely that Bernie Sanders was going to become the nominee because he had the most pledged delegates, well, we remember the talks of Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, they all raised their hands when asked if somebody who uh, didn't get the most votes should win, possibly. Essentially implying, is it okay or is it permissible or morally right to use superdelegates to steal the nomination away from someone that we don't like? And we saw what happened. Everyone raised their hands. Bernie Sanders was the only person who said, no, the person with the most votes is the person who should become the Democratic Party nominee. And we we never saw what happened. But I think that we all could have anticipated a lot of corporate Democrats denouncing Bernie Sanders, possibly endorsing Donald Trump over him. I mean, this is all speculative, right? Because we, we can't run back and, and, and play that out to see what happens in an alternate setting. But still... It's frustrating that Democrats continue to do this again and again and again. And this race with Byron Brown is a microcosm of a bigger issue of the Democratic Party doing everything they can to stop progressives, but uh, prop themselves up. And, you know, it's because they're, they're serving their donors. They're operating at the behest of the people who get them into power in the first place. But uh, either way, it, it's good to see Bernie Sanders shame them for their hypocrisy, and it's good to see him fundraise for India Walton, because even though I, I think that she has a really great chance of winning, I don't want to risk it. I don't want this to be another race where we lose. I mean, we we just saw, uh, you know, a, a victory taken from us with Nina Turner. We were right there, and we lost. So I don't want that to be the case again. I don't want to take any chances. Definitely, if you can, support India Walton, because if she is successful, this is a win for all of us, not just India Walton, not just Buffalo. It's a win for all of us. I feel like it's pretty obvious as to why everyone should be opposed to Enbridge's Line 3 pipeline. I mean, we have a limited window of opportunity to act to stop the worst of what climate change has to offer and to construct a new pipeline that would emit the equivalent of 50 coal power plants of CO2. It's 
at this point, it's suicidal, right? It's further entrenching us in this system of fossil fuel reliance when we should be moving away from fossil fuels entirely and as a society investing in clean, green, and renewable technology. So the climate aspect, the tribal sovereignty that's violated to construct this pipeline, all of these are crucial in this story. But another element that was uh, reported on by The Guardian's Hillary Beaumont is shocking. This is a bombshell, and I haven't heard anyone speak about this yet, and I had to talk about this because it also speaks to the conflict of interest with police officers who were brutalizing protesters there. So here's what Beaumont writes. The Canadian company Enbridge has reimbursed U.S. police $2.4 million for arresting and surveilling hundreds of demonstrators who oppose construction of its Line 3 pipeline, according to documents The Guardian obtained through a public records request. Enbridge has paid for officer training, police surveillance of demonstrators, officer wages, overtime, benefits, meals, hotels, and equipment. Police have arrested more than 900 demonstrators opposing Line 3 and its impact on climate and indigenous rights, according to the Pipeline Legal Action Network. It's common for protesters opposing pipeline construction to face private security as they did during demonstrations against the Dakota Access Pipeline. But in Minnesota, a financial agreement with a foreign company has given public police forces an incentive to arrest demonstrators. The Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, which regulates pipelines, decided rural police should not have to pay for increased strain from Line 3 protests. As a condition of granting Line 3 permits, the commission required Enbridge to set up an escrow account to reimburse police for responding to demonstrations. Enbridge told The Guardian an independent account manager allocates the funds and police decide when protesters are breaking the law. But records obtained by The Guardian show the company meets daily with police to discuss intelligence gathering and patrols. And when Enbridge wants protesters removed, it calls police or sends letters. Our police are beholden to a foreign company, Tara Hoska, founder of the Indigenous frontline group Genua Collective told The Guardian they are working hand in hand with big oil. They are actively working for a company. Their duty is owed to the state of Minnesota and to the tribal citizens of Minnesota. It's a very clear violation of the public's trust, she added. So when you see these headlines about how police morale is lower than ever and public trust in police has deteriorated, this is why. Because it's evident they're not serving the people. These are public servants who are working for a private foreign company. That is truly insane. We have a private Canadian company paying public American servants to police and surveil protesters, buying them cheeseburgers, putting them in hotels. It's truly dystopian. I don't know what the right word is, but there's a lot of adjectives that you can use to describe the situation. Orwellian, dystopian, draconian. It's insanity. But this is what you expect from a late-stage capitalist society where police officers, they don't serve the public. They serve the interests of capital. And the Guardian looked over the uh, records that they obtained, and they've determined that there's a really close working relationship between Enbridge and and Minnesota police. So, this shouldn't happen. Minnesota police are supposed to serve the people of Minnesota, not Enbridge. But yet, they were brutalizing these protesters at the behest of a company that was paying them. It's, it's one thing, right? To set up an escrow account, to have the company bear the cost of the additional policing that will result from protests of the pipeline, which people shouldn't be policed for protesting something that shouldn't be happening in the first place. But then to see that they have this really close relationship, it's just, it's sickening. And I say all of this and you might sense this level of ambivalence in my voice. And it's because I'm not surprised by this at all. I am not surprised by this even a little bit. This is what we expect. The cops aren't looking out for citizens. They're not. I mean, think back to 2020 with the George Floyd protests. People who were in the streets marching, maybe you were one of them if you've watched this. Did you believe that the officers were there to protect you or protect property from getting damaged? I mean, it's just overall, we don't value life as a society. We, we just don't. We value capital. Everything else comes second. And this right here kind of proves it.
So it's just one of the many reasons why this pipeline should be opposed. The process itself is inherently gross. I mean, the treatment of these protesters, that's a different story in and of itself. But the fact that the police were abusing these protesters who were exercising their First Amendment rights at the behest of a private company who's paying public police officers to treat them poorly. It's just, it's gross, but predictable. I'm not sure how many of you have noticed, but something really important is taking place all across this country. Workers are all collectively standing up and they're saying enough is enough and they're demanding better, better treatment, livable wages, and all of this activity that we've seen, the rumblings of worker frustration, has all culminated in a moment that could actually really yield change in America at the aggregate level. So we've seen those viral posts of retail workers and fast food employees quitting in mass, taping signs to the drive through of fast food places saying we all quit, we're closed. On top of that, we've seen unionization attempts at Amazon. We've seen strikes from factory workers at Nabisco. Now Kellogg's workers are on strike. 98% of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees voted to strike. 10,000 John Deere workers are on strike. 37,000 healthcare workers at Kaiser Permanente are on strike, according to labor reporter Jonah Furman. I mean, I can't keep up. So much is happening. And in the month of October, alone so many employees are either on strike or they're set to strike that we've reached a number that we haven't seen in this country in a very long time to the point where it now has its own name striketober and as labor reporter dave jameson puts it we now have strike authorizations at john deere strike deadline tonight IATSE Hollywood deadline October 18th and Kaiser Permanente deadline TBD. That's around 90,000 workers right there. Those are the kind of numbers you don't see anymore. This phenomenon is what union power looks like in action. And for the workers who don't have unions, they're currently waking up and realizing the importance of unions. And if they're not able to go on strike because they don't have a union to back them up, well, what they're trying to do is create unions. So we heard about the uh, Bessemer, Alabama union attempt earlier this year. Well, now Starbucks employees are trying to create the first unions in the chain's history. There's no unions for Starbucks workers, but in Buffalo, New York, well, that could change. So Starbucks actually closed two stores in Buffalo that are trying to unionize. Now they're saying that it totally has nothing to do with the unionization attempts. One of the stores, according to them, is closed for remodeling and another is closed for hiring. But I think it's pretty obvious that they're lying. They closed these stores down because they want to shut down this unionization attempt. Because in the event Starbucks workers can unionize, then like these other workers who have unions, they have a lot more power. And you don't have all the power if you have a union, but you have more leverage. You have a bigger say. And so overall, Striketober is about workers finally demanding better treatment, livable wages, and to actually be taken seriously, to be respected. And it's a human right, so I think that they should be valued. And the more workers that stand up, the more that other employers are going to get worried. Now, for more insight on this, we go to Julia Connolly of Common Dreams, who describes what labor leaders are saying about Striketober. Former Labor Secretary Robert Reich observed Wednesday that with employees and in industries across the spectrum set to strike in the coming days following corporate leaders' failure to meet their demands for fair pay and working conditions, the U.S. is closer than it has been in decades to experiencing a general strike. You might say workers have declared a national general strike until they get better pay and improved working conditions, wrote Reich in The Guardian. No one calls it a general strike, but in its own disorganized way, it's related to the organized strikes breaking out across the land. Hollywood TV and film crews, John Deere workers, Alabama coal miners, Nabisco workers, Kellogg workers, nurses in California, healthcare workers in Buffalo. Corporate America wants to frame this as a labor shortage, wrote Reich. Wrong. What's really going on is more accurately described as a living wage shortage, a hazard pay shortage, a child care shortage, a paid sick leave shortage, and a health care shortage. Unless these shortages are rectified, many Americans won't return to work anytime soon. As IITSC members' potential strike drew near, 
the union pointed out that some of its members, stagehands and theater tech workers at North Shore Music Theater in Beverly, Massachusetts, secured livable wages after striking for just one day this month. NSMT crew were previously paid 60% less than the industry area average, but will now be receiving wages starting at $18 an hour, said the union last week. AFL-CIO President Liz Schuler told The Hill that the striketober movement shows that with economic inequality getting worse and worse, unions are the solution. This is the capitalist system that has driven us to the brink, Schuler said. And she is precisely it. It was only a matter of time until all of these frustrations bubbled up. But really, it took a couple of workplaces fighting for unions, striking to get others to see, and it was kind of like a domino effect. And on top of that, I think that the pandemic has exacerbated all of the terrible conditions that workers have been dealing with. So this is a really, really important moment in history. And all of the stories from workers is important. But one that I want to draw your attention to is the striking workers at Kellogg's and a more perfect union put out a really insightful video about this. I don't think I can play the clip because I believe that they have copyrighted music in it, but workers explain how they've been forced to work 16 hour days and they're expected to use vacation days whenever they're sick. They can't afford to feed their families. I mean, it's a pretty common thing that we're hearing about. So it's really important. And what you can do to help these striking workers is show solidarity with them. So when they're striking, do not cross the picket line. That means that if Kellogg's workers are striking, you don't buy Kellogg's cereal. We need to let these companies know, even if it's in a really subtle, seemingly insignificant way, that we stand with workers. We don't want to buy their products if they're going to mistreat and underpay their employees. So overall, that's basically what Striketober is. It is a collection of workers across this country rising up and finally demanding better. And you love to see it. I hope that this becomes an annual thing. Perhaps this might pave the way towards an actual general strike. But when you have little strikes taking place, little uh, attempts to unionize here and there across the country all together collectively... What you see are employers finally realize that they can't just take these workers for granted any longer. And it's it's encouraging. This is the first labor story that I've talked about in quite some time where I actually genuinely feel encouraged to share this news with you. I mean, of course, it, it's sad that it's come to this, right? But to see workers take a stand and stand up for themselves, that really is a phenomenon that I, I, I just, I love to see. I think it's pretty obvious that the Republican Party's base is unquestionably loyal to Donald Trump, and he's well aware of this fact. The Republican Party establishment and leadership, however, not necessarily. I mean, they'll play nice with Donald Trump publicly, but behind the scenes, you know that they hate his guts, and the feeling is mutual. Donald Trump hates them as well, and the precise reason as to why Trump doesn't like the Republican Party leadership and why he's taken shots at Mitch McConnell is because they won't tow the line that he wants them to tow. He wants them, even in October of 2021, to say that the election was stolen. He wants them to pretend as if he won, but it was just stolen away from him due to widespread fraud committed by the Democratic Party. But they, they won't do that as much as he wants them to. So he has a plan, which he's concocting currently, to try to get them to play the games that he wants them to play, no matter how unreasonable he seems and how unreasonable it makes them seem. And this strategy is actually brilliant, but it is incredibly, incredibly destructive, not just to the Republican Party, but possibly democracy itself. So NBC News reporter Sahil Kapoor says this via Twitter, Trump just threatened to have Republican voters stay home in 2022 and 2024 unless the party is able to solve, by which he seems to mean overturn, the result of the last presidential election, which he lost. The statement reads, if we don't solve the presidential election fraud of 2020, which we have thoroughly and conclusively documented, no, you have not, Republicans will not be voting in 2022 or 2024. It is the single most important thing for Republicans to do. So what he's doing here is huge. He's saying the single most important thing for his followers to do is to boycott the 2022 and 2024 elections if he's not installed as president. I mean, there's a couple of caveats here, right? It's Donald Trump, so he might change his mind in five minutes and say, no, of course, I would never encourage Republicans to boycott these elections. We've got to win. We've got to beat the uh, the Democrats. But if he actually sticks to this, 
the base would absolutely listen to him. I don't think anyone doubts that. The base would not go against their dear leader because, I mean, it's to the point where I don't think you can say that this is just a normal political wing of the Republican Party. It's a cult. It's a cult of personality. The loyalty to Donald Trump is what they uh, want above everything else. So if he says don't vote, the Republican Party is toast. So he's putting them in this unwinnable situation to where if they don't somehow install him as president or at a minimum advocate for him to be reinstalled as president, then he's going to tell all of the base to stay home. It's truly insane. Now, as Sahil Kapoor put it, the same fabricated claims of fraud arguably depressed GOP turnout in the Georgia runoffs and helped Democrats win the Senate. And that's right. And I'm not necessarily one to say that Trump is super strategic and he's politically savvy and he's playing 40 chess. But here, it seems like this is part of a bigger plan. And as Politico reporter Sam Stein put it, he's setting up a situation in which he drags the entirety of the party into questioning election legitimacy as a platform. He's already making headway. So with this one move, he can get the entire Republican establishment to bend to his will like that. They'll ask him how high when he tells them to jump. Now, in the short term, this is great news for Democrats, right? Because they're going to win every single election for the foreseeable future. So long as Donald Trump says, don't vote, the system is rigged. Long term, however, this is incredibly destructive to democracy. Because if you have the base of one of two major parties in the United States basically think that their vote doesn't count at all. And if they no longer believe that the democratic process is the main way that they can affect political change, well, then they'll begin to opt for undemocratic means to affect political change. And overall, with time, that starts to cause democracy to uh, erode. Support for democracy declines. And we've seen just within the last year the impact that that has. We've had members of the Republican Party's base openly call for a military coup here in the United States. There have been reporters that interview Trump supporters at Trump rallies that still take place in 2021, and they say, yeah, the election was stolen, and I would welcome a military coup. Some are even saying, yeah, the, the military, they're already planning to uh, reinstall Donald Trump. So you can only keep up this charade for so long until democracy itself begins to really suffer more so than it already has. But the only way Trump can pull this off is if that base remains loyal to him. If, you know, they start to gravitate towards someone else like Ron DeSantis, Trump no longer really has that much sway. But the problem for the Republican Party is that he still is the most influential figure within the Republican Party. As Lexi Lonas of The Hill reports, former President Trump holds a 35-point lead over Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former Vice President Mike Pence in a hypothetical 2024 GOP primary matchup, a new Morning Consult Politico poll found. 47% of respondents in the survey said they would vote for Trump, while only 12% each said they would vote for DeSantis or Pence, the only candidates other than Trump to hit double digit support the huge lead highlights the popularity of trump who has repeatedly floated but not confirmed another white house run continues to enjoy in the republican party he has said however his supporters will be very happy when he does announce his decision and that he could easily defeat other candidates and believes most people would drop out if he entered the race if i faced desantis i'd beat him like i would beat everyone else trump said in an interview earlier this month but i think most people would drop out i think he would drop out and I don't usually say this, but I agree with Donald Trump. I think that they would all clear the field for Donald Trump in the same way that we saw basically every single Democrat clear the field for Hillary Clinton in 2016. We're going to see all Republicans clear the field for Donald Trump in 2024. Maybe there's going to be like one uh, centrist -y Republican, a more moderate Republican step up and try to be the anti-Trump, but Trump is going to dominate if these numbers hold. So could Trump feasibly manipulate the entire Republican Party base into boycotting the 22 and 24 elections if he wants them to, if he wants to find some way to manipulate the Republican Party establishment? Absolutely. He knows this. The heart of the GOP still lies with Donald Trump. So if he really, really wants to, he could crush the Republican Party and bring every single establishment figure within the Republican Party to heel. 
and they're not happy about that prospect. But wow, if he did this, that would be certainly entertaining to watch. But long term, like I said, pretty destructive to democracy as well, aside from the short term benefits that Democrats would reap from this insane move. Well, folks, Jordan Peterson is back. In fact, come to think of it, I don't know if he actually ever really left because I haven't been following the career of Jordan Peterson. But I'm told that this man is supposedly an intellectual, a right-wing intellectual, which is an oxymoron, but nonetheless, he's supposed to be really smart. But he put out a banger of a tweet that I had to talk about because it proves that even the smartest people on the right aren't as intelligent as the dumbest people on the left. So he thought he'd do a little bit of a sick burn on leftists, a bit of a gotcha. But I'm going to explain to you why this is incredibly stupid. So he tweeted out, It's mystifying to see so little skepticism of oft-vilified big pharma re-COVID vaccines on the left. Can someone explain this? Now, it's a bit of a rhetorical question for him because he knows the answer. The answer is, oh, well, it's because leftists are hypocrites. That's the point that he's trying to make. Now, maybe he'd argue, no, I'm just being intellectually curious. That's a really bad Jordan Peterson impression. It's it's the best Kermit the Frog that I could muster up. But nonetheless, maybe he, he would try to play this off as, I'm just asking questions about the left. I'm genuinely honest. I'm asking earnestly. But we know what this is about. He could play dumb, but he's trying to do a bit of a gotcha to the left. And he thinks that this is a really big brain take. But it's not. It's the brainlet meme with the hamster wheel on the head. You know which one I'm talking about. It's stupid. I mean, what is the expectation for leftists? Do you think that we're supposed to reject modern medicine and embrace faith healing, use crystals to heal ourselves, uh, essential oils? What do you expect? Of course, we use the products that Big Pharma produces. When we have a headache, uh, most people on the left, I'm assuming, they take Tylenol, manufactured by Big Pharma. If somebody on the left has diabetes, they're going to take insulin. So this isn't the own that you think it is. In fact, it makes you look intellectually dishonest and lazy. This is sloppy thinking, and it's a really sad attempt at a gotcha. And really what this may be is him signaling his next trajectory to kind of jump on this anti-vax grift bandwagon, because I'll tell you this, as a small of a mi minority, uh, the anti-vaxxers are in this country. They absolutely are passionate. And anyone on this platform who pays lip service to uh, anti-vaxxers or on any platform, really, they get very, very popular. And you can test this out. Just look at any channel that recently started to cover the vaccines in a negative way recently. Look at their analytics. Go to Social Blade. Look at the boost in subs and uh, views that they got because of this anti-vax rhetoric. So it's, it's really popular. And so if you're a grifter, this is a very potentially lucrative thing to, to talk about. But there's a bunch of uh, leftists on the internet who responded, and I had to share what they had to say because their responses were perfect. They all dunked on him as they should. Benjamin Dixon responded saying, you're a wee bit late to the grift, Jordan. Exactly. Good politic guy says the actual conspiracy is how the profit motive behind the vaccines has led to a massive global inequality of access costing countless lives purely for the profits of big pharma. The data showing vaccines are effective at preventing hospitalization and death is overwhelming. Exactly. Facts matter. Cody Johnston says vaccines are good and this one is free. Adam Johnson says the left criticism of big pharma is that they're price gouging greedy assholes who deny life-saving drugs to the global south and poor here at home. Not that they invent sinister potions to plant microchips in people dipshit. Natalie Shore chimes in with a perfect point as well, saying the whole reason pharma is so evil is they perform a socially necessary function. If they didn't, they'd be so much lower on the list of terrible industries. And that's precisely it. The issue that the left has collectively with Big Pharma is their greed. It's that they know that what they have, what they've created, oftentimes with public funding, is necessary. And so knowing that people are desperate for the product that they put out, they manipulate. They work with other companies who pr produce similar treatments and they collectively raise the costs, forcing people to pay. I mean, this is what happened with EpiPen. They, they consolidate also. It's, it's the business practices, not that they are going around spreading and creating poison and, and killing people. 
I just feel like he should know this. It's like attacking leftists for participating in society. Oh, well, you don't like uh, capitalism? Well, I see that you've got a cell phone there. Capitalism invented that cell phone. Capitalism led to the innovation and the technology that uh, led to you having a cell phone. Okay, you can still participate in society and have criticisms of society. So for Jordan Peterson, a so-called intellectual to make this point, I mean, I've just got a question. What was he saying before? Was he ever actually that intellectual? Were people listening to the arguments that he was making? Because I first heard of Jordan Peterson because of his anti-trans hysteria. He claimed that a bill in Canada would lead to people going to jail if they misgender somebody who's transgender when zero people have been jailed as a result of that law. So the dude doesn't really seem like he knows what he's talking about and if anything he seems like a hack and the one good thing about jordan peterson was that he kind of offered these self-help tips he was he was a sort of self-help guru but if he ended up going to rehab himself and can't get his own life together wouldn't he have taken his own advice if his advice was worthwhile it just seems like this is someone who really shouldn't be taken seriously based on the things that he said and done and this is just further proof of that. Now, perhaps he'll have his second wind, another 15 minutes of fame by jumping on the anti-vax bandwagon. Maybe this is just a one-off. Either way, this tweet was absolutely idiotic, but it's really the best that you can expect from so-called intellectuals on the right. They have nothing. Their ideas are bankrupt intellectually and morally, and this is why the points that they make, they always seem overly hacky. No, of course, you're not a fucking big pharma shill if you're a leftist who believes in a life-saving vaccine. That doesn't make you a big pharma shill. What would make you a big pharma shill is if you took money from a pharmaceutical company and then you advocated for them. You made arguments on their behalf, but nobody on the left is doing that. When we say you should get the COVID-19 vaccine, it's because we're doing it out of self-interest and a concern for human beings who we do not want to see suffer because of this pandemic. So it just to see this, I mean, it, it's so intellectually sloppy, but it's it's what the right thinks is uh, intelligent. So, OK, keep making silly points like this and we'll keep changing more minds because this is not something that's going to convince normal people that you're being honest. You're a good faith actor. This is bad faith and this is stupid. It's galaxy brain. It's it's low IQ shit. Hi everyone, I have a fantastic guest back again on the program. It's Rebecca Parson running in Washington State's 6th Congressional District against incumbent Democrat Derek Kilmer. And she's here to talk about her campaign once again. Rebecca, welcome back. Hi, uh, really glad to be back. Thanks for having me on again. Glad to have you back. We also and, uh, have a special a guest. Mm -hmm. The campaign pug, half pug. This is Augie. Okay, okay. Well, welcome. Does does uh, Augie do any work on the campaign, uh, distribute flyers, contact uh, supporters? You know, I put her on the phone to follow up with donors and uh, try to do some phone banking, but she just refuses. <laughs> kind of a, you know, hasn't worked a day in her life. Right. Typical liberal dog, right? <laughs> they, they don't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, I, I'm so glad that you're back because uh, you are running for Congress again. So I'll ask you the same question that I asked Isaiah James. What made you want to run again? Because these campaigns are grueling. They are soul crushing at times. Uh, what made you want to do this again? I never want to run once, let alone twice, but you're committed, <laughs> you're dedicated. So uh, why run again? And what makes this run different? Well, I want to run again because I still want to have somebody representing our district who supports Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, housing for all. And uh, my Democratic opponent, Derek Kilmer, does not and has come out publicly saying he does not support Medicare for all and the Green New Deal. And then uh, why run again? Um, I think that it's really important for candidates to think about this, you know, especially in certain candidates like myself, as a, uh, you know, if you don't win the first time, you learn a lot and then use it the second time. 
um, so that we don't just have in the same districts, you know, progressive candidates starting from scratch each time, because you really learn a lot. I got 35,000 votes. Those are voters who would, you know, hope, fingers crossed, vote for me again, and I would be able to build on it to get through the top two primary to the general. Uh, so I think it's, uh, you know, Cori Bush ran twice, uh, and before that she ran for the Senate, so actually three times that she ran. And uh, it's just important, I think, to um, build on build on the experience you got because you have a, you know, it's just incredible what I learned. And so what's different this time is I'm putting a much greater focus on fundraising um, and getting what I need to make that happen, putting in the hours every day, making calls, uh, finding the, you know, really talented people to help me do that, help me raise money, but really prioritizing that because, um, you know, don't take any corporate money and running against somebody who's taken millions of dollars in corporate money and has, I think, over two million cash on hand right now. And so wow. while it might be difficult to ever reach that level that he has, um, you know, the more money I can have, the better. So I can afford things like advertising to reach voters and more mailers and uh, stuff like that. So, yeah. And I yeah. think it's so urgent right now with the climate crisis, too. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we had a lot of people die during the heat wave. And it's just... Uh, more and more intense uh, climate change. And that that's one thing that really, really motivates me. Yeah, same. Uh, I'm also in the Pacific Northwest and this heat wave, it really was the eye opener um, along with the wildfires last year. It seems like if you live here now, it, I mean, if you live anywhere in the world, it's, it's difficult to ignore climate change. But really, this was a wake up call for a lot of people, uh, at least in my own social circles and myself, who weren't necessarily paying attention. And so for lawmakers to still uh, see climate change knocking at our door uh, and not take action, not change the way that they speak about this issue or the urgency with which they deal with climate issues. I feel like it's it's non-negotiable now. If you're not absolutely um pedal to the floor, attacking climate change head on, you're not worthy of being in Congress. So to kind of get to that point, what do you believe as a lawmaker you would do different um, in comparison with Derek Kilmer? Because to me, I view him as kind of a run of the mill corporate Democrat, a milk toast Democrat, doesn't really stand for anything, is just kind of there occupying that seat. He doesn't put himself out there. He doesn't propose anything. So, I mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious, a progressive versus a corporate Democrat, but just uh, speak through, legislatively speaking, what you'd be doing now if you were in Congress that you don't believe he would be doing. I would be pushing for things like getting Medicare for All on the floor to actually vote on. And then looking at the Green New Deal, uh, the parts of the resolution, and many people have different ideas of what a Green New Deal is, but then introducing legislation to actually make that happen. So what exactly, I would like to look at climate change and instead of this kind of mealy mouth, well, net zero by 2050 or yeah. uh, more carbon tax credits, that kind of thing. I think that a politician is not being serious about climate change unless they have dates they're willing to work towards uh, because the the scale, the speed of climate change is going much faster than climate scientists predicted. It's that, you know, we are getting to um, thresholds that they hadn't thought we would get to for years. It's happening really fast. So for example, we need to get off fossil fuels, stop using them, stop subsidizing them, get to 100% renewables. And so for my date, I set that as 2030, because I think that politicians should have a date they're actually working towards. What is the plan? Uh, treat it like you would any job. You don't go into work and it's like, okay, we're going to try to grow the business by 10% this year, but we're just kind of, you know, do whatever and bumble along the way. You create a, a plan. Here's the benchmarks and the dates that we're trying to achieve things by and at least um, introduce that legislation. And then in terms of things like, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, continue. In terms of things like uh, the current, you know, Build Back Better bill, um, I would be holding the line and not caving to the centrists like Manchin and Cinema, uh, Gottheimer, who are trying to tank it. And then also keep calling attention to the fact that $3.5 trillion was the compromise. <laughs> Originally, yeah. um, even Biden himself was talking about numbers as high as 10 trillion. And even if it were 3.5 trillion and all of that was for climate, it still wouldn't be enough for climate. And it's not yeah. all for climate. <laughs> and so it's not enough. And so I would keep uh, bringing that up and refuse to cave because as long as progressives keep caving, um, we, we can't progress. 
Yeah, I, I'm kind of curious, and it's hard to draw a really clear line, but what would be your number? Because Joe Biden said, all right, the $3.5 trillion, it's got to come down. And now the uh, leadership of the Congressional Progressive Caucus is saying, OK, we're willing to talk numbers with you. What are the specifics that you want to cut? They're saying this to the uh, the uh, moderates. So in terms of what is your line, what is it for you? Like for me, I feel like the floor would be no less than $3 trillion. Otherwise, I don't support the bipartisan infrastructure deal. But even that, you can argue, is kind of caving in a way because, as you said, this is already a compromise. <laughs> it's over 10 years. So it's honestly embarrassing that there's even a conversation about coming down from $3.5 trillion. That being said, it, you know, at this point in time, there's so much in that that if we can get something through that will make a difference during a pandemic... I think it would make a difference. So it's it's tough. And morally, I don't know where I would have to draw a line. Do you do you have a sense of where you would you would stop and, and you'd just you'd check out and say, no vote from from me? I'd stick to 3.5 trillion and say, like, look, this isn't the way negotiations work. You don't work walk into a car dealership and it's like uh, no, sorry, the amount you're asking for is too much. And then they're like, what do you want to pay instead? And I say, what do you want me to pay instead? You know, it's like, you yeah, know, it's, yeah. a, it's a two-way street. And so the um, corporate conservative Democrats who are holding this up, uh, they're saying we're not going to vote for it. It's like, okay, come up with an offer. But in the meantime, I'm sticking to $3.5 trillion because uh, that's what's needed. And if you look at it in terms of what, what uh, members of Congress should be doing with ideally what they would be doing is trying to help people, help their constituents. So say, okay, we're going to cut here. How many homeless people will freeze to death over the winter because you cut housing funding? Or, um, you know, how many families will put off having children and grandparents won't get their first grandkid? How much longer will they put that off because uh, people just can't afford to have a kid without um, childcare subsidies? Um, and put it in terms of those really concrete terms like, okay, Joe Manchin, what's your number? How many homeless people do you wanna die this winter? Um, and put it back at them that way and be just really blunt because that's what it's about is, is people's lives. Yeah, and that's that's a really great point. What's, what's frustrating to me is, um, the way that progressives oftentimes negotiate themselves too much down, not to say that I have much criticism of the progressives in the House because they have done a great job at holding the line for the most part. But I think that if you rather than coming down from six trillion to three point five, maybe you come down to five trillion and then you work down from there to get closer towards your goal. Um, it's just it's frustrating because I see these articles and it's about Democratic Party operatives freaking out about 2022, Joe Biden sinking approval rating. And I mean, there's a gigantic gift that is waiting to be gifted if they just pass this legislation. Um, but they're not doing that. So I, I like that you would work in, you know, their constituents and whatnot. One thing that I wanted to ask you, because you are a grassroots candidate, how would you or would you use the grassroots as part of your legislative process? Because oftentimes in Congress, you know, you 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 give and you take, you make deals, you you say, I'll support this if you support my policy with other lawmakers, your colleagues. But uh, how would you bring in the grassroots? Because I think that what people really would like to see is lawmakers trying to galvanize their constituents to take action, to make calls, to, if if need be, show up in D.C. Is that something that you would work in to the equation, or, or do you think it actually requires more members of Congress to kind of all bring their constituents together? Because I think that it might be difficult for one lawmaker to do it, but what's your view on this overall and what the role should be, and ideally what you would do uh, to try to um, boost grassroots organizing as it relates to legislative deal making, I would definitely use the grassroots and uh, reach out to constituents in my district, but then also progressive nationwide. Um, you know, since the last primary, uh, since my primary, you know, last August and now over the winter, I did uh, a lot of direct action around housing. I co-founded a group called Tacoma Housing Now, and together with other uh, groups that were part of that coalition. Uh, we occupied empty buildings, including a middle school that had been empty for 11 years, turned it, we just declared, we're turning this into emergency pandemic housing, put out a press release and said to the city, you know, deal with it. Uh, this building has been empty for over a decade, you're doing nothing with it. Um, so we're just going to turn it into emergency pandemic housing so no more people die over the winter. And then when they kicked us out, we went on to do other actions. So we shut down an intersection and put a tent in the middle of it, since so many people are sleeping in tents and encampments. Uh, since they refused to provide any trash services to the camps, we took a cue from the Young Lords 
And uh, we went to the camp, we rented some U-Hauls, uh, went to the camps, picked up, and it was mountains of trash, filled two U-Haul trucks and dumped it in front of City Hall. And lo and behold, they suddenly moved it. And when they, the, they picked up the trash really quickly, suddenly they were able to provide trash service. And then over Christmas, we, uh, we paid for people, 43 people to stay in a hotel for uh, Christmas Eve. And then on Christmas Day, we announced uh, the county needs to pay with the free money from FEMA that they could be applying for and using right now. And that kind of stuff got action, whereas years and years of kind of polite calling and going to city council meetings and setting up meetings, let's meet with the mayor, let's meet with that person, uh, let's have a summit, let's talk some more. Uh, it just doesn't work because politicians know how to talk the talk they'll meet with you and be like oh yes i really value um equity and equality and we need to um just and they just throw in buzzwords to them i mean the, these aren't just buzzwords used are important concepts that they just treat mm -hmm. like buzzwords and they just kind of talk the talk and nothing changes but because of us our action um they added 200 shelter beds to the system they made a extended a shelter was going to end in the middle of winter. They extended it through to the spring. And that stuff definitely saved lives because people die every winter here. And so as a legislator, I would want to do the same thing, speak with organizers, develop a plan. And what is a nonviolent direct action that we could take to really force Congress's hand? And I would be willing to, to do that and um, use the grassroots to take direct action because as one out of 435 votes, or uh, one out of, I think it's about 100 in the Progressive Caucus. Um, that's just one vote. And so I would, would definitely have a lot more power to to pressure uh, other legislators by using nonviolent direct action. Yeah, I like that you, ha you have that history as an activist because you know specifically through experience what gets lawmakers to pay attention. And that's really important. You know what makes them tick. You know what gets them to actually hear people and not just ignore them. So I think that that's really important. Um, going into Congress, you will inevitably be faced with really, really complex situations that aren't usually black and white. Oftentimes, you'll see large bills, large spending bills that contain a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. But I want to propose a hypothetical situation just to see how you would handle this as a lawmaker. And I don't really feel like there's any right or wrong answer. It's pretty complex. I don't know how I would deal with this, but let's say that there's another $3.5 trillion spending bill that comes up uh, and there's lots of really, really great things in it. There is paid family leave. There is additional funding for housing. Uh, there's an expansion of Medicare and Medicaid uh, to the state so they can expand health care. But at the same time, in that same bill, in that same package is a poison pill. Uh, it's defunding the U.S. Postal Service uh, or privatizing it. Uh, there's something in there that's really bad. What do you do in that instance? Because, I mean, as a lawmaker, from a marketing standpoint, it could be swung in either way. Progressives can say, well, Rebecca Parson, she caved. She voted to defund the U.S. Postal Service. Or they could say she voted for paid uh, family leave and housing funding. How do you handle that situation? Because it, it's bound to come up, and we've seen it time and again with progressive lawmakers in Congress, and I don't always feel like they've handled these situations in a good way, but at the same time, it, it's difficult to deal with these things. So what do you do as a lawmaker in that instance? Well, I think what the Progressive Caucus this congressional session has been doing is great. And I know they made some structural changes. I read a couple articles saying they moved from ha uh, having two chairs to having just one so they could get things done faster mm -hmm. and make more speedy decisions and not get kind of right. outplayed by the rest of the Democratic caucus that was able to act faster. So, uh, And yeah. they've been holding the line. So I think uh, encouraging more of that, maybe there also needs to be an additional group that's smaller um, that also decides, you know, how they're going to act and tactics and looks at the numbers, uh, whatever the numbers of Democrat Republican would be in, in the next congressional uh, session. And perhaps, you know, maybe come up with our own tactics as a smaller group of five to 10 people. Um, and then also direct action, like, okay, if you're going to defund the post office, uh, I would get in touch with activists and maybe come up with some creative direct action that we could do um, to, to, get people's attention. And I think it's important with direct action as well to um, do something that poses a, a nonviolent threat to um, the flow of capital or um, to whatever it might be, whoever you're trying to target. So you're not just kind of waving signs. There's a place for, for protests and sign waving, but with direct action, you want to you know, choose your target and a method to really get their attention. So that, that's the kind of stuff I would do. And then, um, try to go on, get as much media attention as I could to the fact that there's this poison pill in there 
Um, and yeah, that's what I would do. And not, I'm not going to give, just hold the line. Like, I'm not going to vote for this. It has this giant poison pill in it and use as many methods as I can to draw attention to that. Yeah, I, I like your answer because really what I think that viewers are looking for is at least some instinct to fight it, not just kind of accept it. Well, this is, you know, the situation. These are the cards that we were dealt because I think that there's always some way that you can change things and, and make a difference. And holding the line really does go a long way. I mean, if progressives in Congress mm -hmm. actually did this more frequently, I think that uh, – that they would have a lot more power in Congress. And I, I feel like now they're going to see it because of how successful they've been with this $3.5 trillion reconciliation package. They, they see how when they bind together and they don't break and they hold the line, they really get things done. They shape the narrative. And mm -hmm. it's really great to see. So I'm glad that you said that. Uh, another question that I want to ask is relatively hypothetical as well, but this is bound to come up. So, you know, let's say you get elected to Congress and you have a couple of bills that you want to um, introduce and you need lots of co-sponsors. You want hearings on these in committees. Um, but one of the members who is heavily considering co-sponsoring this bill is a primary opponent to another fellow uh, brand new congressperson, the uh, 2024 lineup. And so the stipulation is that if he co-sponsors your bill, you can't endorse his primary opponent. Now, the bill is important. It's climate change legislation. Uh, what do you do in this instance? Because that's really tough. And I feel like that kind of played into AOC's calculation back in 2020 when she didn't endorse Cori Bush um, because uh, Lacey Clay ended up co-sponsoring her uh, Green New Deal resolution. What do you do in this situation? That's a really good question. I think I would still err on the side of supporting their primary challenger and just finding some other way. So I know Congress likes to pass these huge bills that go through because then they can get these poison pills in and say to the other side, yep. well, but if you don't vote for it, you know, use our own arguments back at us. You know, how many homeless people won't be able to get into a shelter, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, instead of passing, which I think would be much more ideal, um, this is something that the host of Congressional Dish podcast has talked about, is like one bill. So this is, you know, the funding for homeless shelters bill. And this is the funding for... Um, uh, like fit, uh, increasing the fish population in a certain area, like very specific individual bills so that you don't have 20 different topics all covered in one bill. Um, I think I would push for that kind of thing. And so then if it's put, okay, I'm not going to co-sponsor your bill because of the, you know, because you won't agree to uh, not, you know, not support my primary opponent, try to find some other way to get it through an amendment. Um, like the, the culture of Congress as a whole, it, it seems from the outside that it would be very hard to change. They're used to passing these enormous bills. Um, and so if that's the way it's going to be, okay, then maybe I go to some other ally and say, well, could you get this small thing through as an amendment to your bill? Don't You don't even have to put my name on it or anything, but try to get it through that way. And I think try to find the little, you know, legislative routes that you can get things in so that you still achieve your goal without sacrificing your principles to the greatest yeah. extent possible. Yeah, I like that answer. I, I think I would do the same thing because ultimately, even if we need support for these bills, you know, progressives in Congress need to build power at the same time. Nothing will really change if we don't change the makeup of Congress. So I would also prioritize that. Uh, so I, I appreciate your answer there. OK, last hypothetical, I promise. Uh, this one's a fun one. You're on the House floor. You're debating a bill. And Marjorie Taylor Greene walks up to you and she calls you a <laughs> communist and tells you to take off your mask. What do you do in that situation? Do you run or do you confront her? <laughs> uh, I ask her if she's carrying. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's smart, actually. <laughs> because I think um, during the Civil War, didn't a Northern congressman and a southern congressman actually got into a fist fight on the floor and one of them was severely injured i, was like, I just would want to make sure that i physically safe <laughs> yes priority number one yes yeah, yeah then, <laughs> go ahead yeah. yeah just ask her to back away like no thank you i don't want the covid that you're certainly i without <laughs> yeah. carrying please get away from me <laughs> yeah it's it, it's it's something that I think about now where Congress isn't just full of all of these robotic, mindless corporate drones. We have a lot of really crazy people in there. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, yeah. it's not like it's not like this is a new phenomenon with Marjorie Green. We've had Louis Gohmert there for a while, uh, but it's still I, I feel like the level of insanity that we're seeing from Congress it has increased measurably so. So I, I just I'm curious how you deal with this. Watching the progressives in Congress deal with Marjorie Green, I know Cory Bush had to move her office. Uh, she was screaming at another member of Congress outside on the steps of Capitol Hill. I can't remember who. It's just it's truly bizarre. So you know, just from a human standpoint, I think it's interesting to ask these questions just out of curiosity yeah. because I, I mean we all want to know how how you handle these very weird and bizarre situations and of course it's always going to be an answer that is an adult answer <laughs> you know uh, okay yeah. last question you know my viewers they're familiar with you they know all of your policies you know medicare for all green new deal so uh give us your last pitch what do you need how do we help you get elected uh, do you need more uh, more uh donors do you need people on the ground what do you need fr from us and also uh make your pitch as to why you should replace Derek kilmer well, I could really use people's help with all of the things you mentioned. If you can donate, that's a big help. You can go to RebeccaParson.com and click the donate button to do that. Um, a dollar helps. Every every donation, no matter how big or small, helps. You can also sign up for the email list uh, and then reply to any of those emails if you want to help with volunteering. You know, you can help with uh, text banking. We're doing that right now for donations. You can help with that. Uh, later on, we'll have phone banking. If you're in district, um, definitely, and you're interested in uh as it's safe and, and as the campaign progresses, doing canvassing and knocking on doors. Um, it also helps no matter where you are, if you could tell somebody who you think might be like-minded about the campaign, because uh, it, you're a lot more likely to be persuasive to somebody who knows you and trusts you than my campaign, just cold contacting the same person. So it actually helps a lot. Hey, check out this candidate. Um, or suggest they donate or sign up for the email list or something like that. So those are all things people could do to help. and. As to why I should replace Derek Kilmer, uh, well, he's the 13th most conservative Democrat in the House. He has come out publicly saying he opposes Medicare for all and the Green New Deal. Um, last session, he was chair of the New Democrat Coalition, which is a you know conservative corporate large wing of the Democratic Party. So he's somebody who's building quietly building a career for himself, working his way up the ladder. And as the kind of person we want to stop from getting, going up and up and up in positions of leadership and continuing to block progress, because like you said earlier, he is somebody who just follows you know when back when he was in the washington state legislature a reporter asked him the debate at the time was about gay marriage he was asked do you support it and he just smiled and said i don't think we should redefine marriage and now he puts himself forward as this big you know i want my daughters mm -hmm. to grow up in a world where everybody can love whoever they want and i was like well yeah 10 years after it's safe to say that <laughs> right. you're saying? yeah how courageous <laughs> so you, i know if you so yeah, I think I should replace him for those reasons. And because our district is really struggling with stuff, people are across the country. I mean, homelessness is increasing. People can't who people who are in homes can't afford their rent. It's you know up to fifty percent of their income. Um, they have are working multiple jobs that don't have benefits. Uh, parents are working all the time and can't afford to have a child or can't afford to have more kids. I mean, the problems that people are having around the country, we're having in this district too. And stuff like the Green New Deal would help so much with the, the jobs guarantee that's part of the Green New Deal. And this district has benefited from policies like that in the past. You know, the New Deal, uh, FDR's New Deal jobs programs, we had seven of those uh, work camps here in the district that gave people jobs. Um, there's a lot to improve on. Those policies were written and implemented in a racist way. So we, of course, want to improve on them. But, you know, this district, and I'm sure probably every district around the country has a history of like when the government could actually um, do something positive, like provide jobs, get people to work at jobs that actually pay. So those are the things that I, I support and why I think I should replace Derek Kilmer. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And we all are absolutely wishing you luck. And we hope that you crush it. And I think that you will. You're a great candidate. And, it, you know, it's nice to see you return. I always hope that candidates, <laughs> when they announce that they're running, they commit to at least two runs because that yeah. increases the likelihood that you'll win. So I really appreciate the sacrifice that you're making. Lord knows I would not want to do that. But I thank you for running and trying to break through this horrible corporate corrupt Congress that we have. So uh, thank you so much. We'll continue to follow your campaign. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for everything you do. Well, folks, that is all that I have on the agenda for today's show. Hopefully you enjoyed that if you've made it to this point in the episode. And as usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of the folks 
who make this show possible. All of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members who help us not just to survive, but thrive as well. Thank you all so much. You are truly crucial uh, in our show's success. So I'm going to stop rambling. I will see you all next week. But as usual, if you want more of the humanist report, you can find me on Thursdays at 7 p.m. over at twitch.tv slash humanist report where I'm talking politics. I'm streaming uh, video games and we just usually have a fun time overall. But that's it, folks. Take care, everyone. My name is Mike Figueroa. This has been The Humanist Report. You could support The Humanist Report at patreon.com slash humanist report. But trust me, I'd have way more supporters on Patreon if that was my podcast. Sad. <laughs>